But without that action, there could be no progress along the road. Some of our conversation could be about encouraging more of our members to take a, a greater part in any of these activities. The idea raised recently of mentoring for would-be writers is excellent. Everyone, at the very least, has a personal story of how they came to join the party. Readers of the standard will relate to different individuals' very different stories. Better put the editorial committee on alert for an imminent influx. And letter writing also is to be encouraged, especially to publications likely to be read by fellow travellers of various hues. Let's talk to each other about what to write, how to deal with certain objections, what to include and exclude, <coughs> to increase the likelihood of getting a letter published, always remembering it's highly unlikely to have a 100% acceptance rate. Just keep writing them anyway and don't forget to send them. As for the internet, this is an incredible tool to be used by all who can. And this is someone who's a bit of a technophobe. Please don't tell me you're too old, too stuck in your ways, haven't got the time or inclination to learn. I have been there. First, it's easier to read print than it is a lot of our handwriting. You can send out missives multiple times if you want, a lot cheaper than by mail, and they arrive a lot quicker. Plus, you can research whatever you want with only minor hassle, believe me. Just to give encouragement to other computer phobes, I really did hate the whole idea that I was presented with my own machine last summer, and although it's still not my favourite pastime, I do recognise its usefulness. I can do all that I need to do to stay in touch and submit articles, even though we have no internet facility at home and I have to find a friendly restaurant or hotspot in order to log on. Anyway, regarding conversations, Everything is possible. Let's expand the agenda whilst remaining aware that talking the talk is fine as long as we're also walking the walk. I move on to the second part here, which is how should we ensure that we stay motivated? Well, I've asked why do we need motivation? Is it to keep us going when we're tired or just plain sick and tired? Is it to pick us up when we feel we're getting nowhere, to keep us keeping on? Each individual have their own bête noire or, or particular focus, whether positive or negative, that flicks their switch and motivates them to continue emphasising the aspect in whatever way they consider appropriate. Association with like-minded individuals or groups can be catalysts. Now, do these necessarily have to be only socialist party individuals and groups? I would say definitely not. We are part of society, whether we like it or not. And within that society are all manner of different interest groups, where we can meet new folk, learn a new skill maybe, or pursue a hobby. It's surprising how much there is to agree, out, to agree about, even with those who seem to be from another planet. Along the road to nowhere, we may find motivation from either end of the spectrum. From the positive desire to work towards socialism because of a firm belief in its principles. Or from the negative emotions of anger, <coughs> frustration, disgust, etc. towards a system that just has to be superseded. Active involvement, at some level, builds motivation and it inspires others and increases their motivation. <coughs> but motivation from outside can be fickle and of short lifespan. It has to be sustained by internalising it. So that, for instance, when one finishes reading a book, an article or a blog that's <coughs> motivated, or one leaves a meeting feeling fired up and ready to go, it's the self-motivation factor that has to be kept alive in order to put in the action that turns a thought into a deed. Whether it's self-motivation, group motivation, motivation of fellow travellers, call it cross-motivation if you like, it's an important factor in sustaining us. 
Ken Smith again. Revolutions are about expectations, about horizons, not about despair and paralysis. It's about keeping the key issue, the abolition of the money economy, clear of short-term defensive activity. Well, I can agree with that. With all the distractions and negativity there is, we mustn't lose sight of the goal. You know, the reality that we have now, the world that we live in, is, is pretty incredible. Certainly a lot of it is totally beyond anything I could ever have imagined. The fantastic, amazing things that humankind has achieved in science, technology, medicine, the arts, architecture. And the horrific, ghastly acts perpetrated one on the other with wars, forced removal of populations, modern day slavery and lack of basic rights for so much of the world's population. So why shouldn't we envisage a society, a world society, that's currently beyond the belief of those who are stuck in the now? Isn't it impossible what others say about us, not what we say about ourselves? Don't we need to consider all possibilities, however unlikely? Don't we need to think outside the box, think laterally? and to keep reminding ourselves and each other of what we expect in our society post-revolution. Harold Lasky, who, if you don't know, he was a political theorist, economist, and he was uh, exec on the executive committee of the Labour Party in 1936, chairman of the Labour Party in 1945-6. He wrote, I think we recognise that it's from the wide range of variations, not from the preservation of uniformities, that progress is born. And he also wrote, we hope to bring from the souls of men and women their richest fruition. The basis of our community could well be consent to disagreement. Now compare that with a cutting I kept from a Turkish newspaper, which was published at the time Richard Dawkins' website was banned in Turkey, and it was the same time that a 16-page article that was due to have been published at the time of Darwin's 200th birthday about him. Uh, it was withdrawn from this, the science magazine. The cutting ended with a, a much-quoted observation by journalist Becky Joshkin, and it could fit any nationality, by the way. And he said... Darwin's evolution theory and methods of selection do not fit the Turks at all. If there had been any evolution, how could we explain the selection procedure that we employ that leads people to vote for the same politicians who leave them unemployed, impoverished and uneducated? Well, which vision do we seek? Which concept motivates and which depresses? Accept the reality but keep that higher ideal fixed <coughs> in the forefront of your imagination. Pessimism of the intellect may be, but optimism of the will. Motivation is different for different people. It's both accepting that we all need it to some degree to enable us to continue with anything at all, and finding and remembering what works best for us as individuals. Knowing that sometimes it's best just to get out from whatever it is that's bogging us down and do something that's fun, enjoyable, different, relaxing or energising. We all need to find and maintain our own self-motivation, but at the same time we can help to motivate others by the actions we take. Now moving on to uh, meetings along the way. 